morning. My name is Katie Hirsch, and I am a curator at the Halsey Institute of Contemporary Art at the College of Charleston. Thank you for joining us for the third of several in conversation events that we'll host over the rest of 2020 for our virtual exhibition, Displacements, Revisitations of Home. Displacements opened on Friday, August 28th, and may be experienced at displacements.org. Displacements, Revisitations of Home features the work of 10 artists who were asked to submit work that spoke most closely to their own reflections on the concept of home. Each artist was paired with a writer who responded to the body of work in an essay. Recordings of all conversation events, including this one, will be available at displacements.org after the fact, as well as archived here on the Halsey Institute's Facebook page. We also invite you to participate in the project by visiting the Engage tab on the website. There, you'll find a phone number that you can use to leave a message sharing your own stories of home, as well as a map where you can add your home alongside those of others. Today, I'm pleased to introduce displacement artist, Ricarda de Ecker and her respondent, Brian Granger. Ricarda de Ecker is an artist who began painting primarily watercolors later in her life. Her love of mountains, particularly the Northern Italian Alps of her homeland is expressed in her work and I'm sure will be expressed for you today. Ricarda joins us today from her homeland of Italy. Brian Granger is Director of Exhibitions and Public Programs at the Halsey Institute of Contemporary Art. Brian has written about Ricarda's work before as he penned an essay to accompany her 2017 exhibition, Montagna, here at the Halsey Institute. Brian joins us this morning from the Halsey here in Charleston, South Carolina. We invite you to leave any comments or questions you have for Ricarda or Brian by entering them in the comments section of the Facebook video. Welcome, Brian and Ricarda. Thanks so much for joining us today. Awesome, thank you so much, Katie. Hey, Ricarda, how are you doing today? I am doing great. I just love the modern tool that we all have. If you think, I mean, we have the whole Atlantic Ocean in between and we are here chatting like the most normal thing. Maybe you are younger than me and you're used to it, but I find it magical every single time. Yeah, absolutely. It is special, yeah, to, to reconnect. And um, as Katie mentioned, we worked together a few years ago on a show here at the Halsey. Um, so I'm glad to uh, be uh, working with you again. So I wanted to go ahead and start off our conversation today. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, your, your background. And I understand that you uh, grew up sort of always uh, in the mountains and the mountains are sort of a big part of your, um, you know, your uh, growing up. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, how, uh, how your mountains uh, uh, helped shape you? Um, yes, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Brian Granger, and thank you for Kat Kathy Hirsch, and it's, it's been lovely. The relationship with the Halsey has really made my life better. I, I grew up, I was born in uh, the northern part of Italy, um, in the bottom of the valley in South Tyrol, and the valley had a an orientation north-south. It was a, a wide valley uh, created by a glacier. So as, as I could describe it, it has a U form. So it's a wide and very, and, and I think that that presence created in me a lot of, a lot of stability, a lot of sense of direction. I mean, north and south, I was very obvious by living there with this big valley and the side valley. And my family, my parents occasionally went hiking and in the Dolomites that were you know, nearby, but they really never brought me. They eventually brought my older brother because he was a boy, a very patriarchal society in Italy. And I always had this idea of this mountain like, a mix of dangerous and attractive. I hear the story of my aunt and uncle. It was always very, very intense and of places that I had a hard time even imagining. And 
And then when I was 11, uh, my family moved to another part of Italy on the flat land, and I felt completely lost. Just the, the lacking of the physical border of your space. You could go forever. I mean, the, the idea that, that there was no limit, it really made me feel uncomfortable. It took me a long time to get used to that kind of space. And then when I was um, in 17, 18, I met somebody that was an instructor at a rock climbing class. And I decided to take it. Not that I thought of climbing. I thought that it could show me the way to go to the mountain by myself. I thought that I was, you know, adult enough to find my way. And, and it was really a crucial moment for me. I still remember very clearly the first time I put my hand on the rock in the act of climbing and I loved it. It was like one of those moments that you recognize thinking backwards, like a, a life changing moment. So I devoted about 10 years just to, to climb. It was also, I guess it was also important for my self-esteem, you know, because, you know, it, it is an activity that nobody could say it doesn't depend from you. It's you and the rock. And if you are able to climb on difficult routes, this is something, it's yours, you own it, you know, it's just, so, and I was pretty good at it from the beginning, and that also was very important. Before finishing my class, I, with other friends, I opened a new route, and my name was on the newspaper, and I was 18, so I felt very, very cool. You know, those kind of things are very important when you're young, or completely not when you, when you grow older. And, um, you know, I have asked myself many times, really at the root of the thing, why I have this total love for the mountain. And I truly, honestly, don't have the real answer. I can tell you stories which are all true. But the other day I was with a friend and she was, we were talking and she was going through a magazine, one of those, you know, fashion and uh, magazine. And it was an advertisement with a picture of the mountain. And I had a moment like when you're in love with somebody and you see him on the street, you know? And I asked myself, why is that? It is maybe because it was present in my life in very crucial moment, probably tied with deep emotion. And it, I even tried um, once to let it go, you know? And I, I get married. My husband is America, moved to New York. I mean, I said, you know, every season has its own fruit. Um, and, then, and then it's always something that attracts me back. And it is, and now I made peace with that. And I really understood that for whatever reason, it is very central in my life, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And so that's kind of, um, I guess that would point to why you have started uh, making paintings. Uh, of mountains and you've only started making paintings in the last decade is that right yeah a little bit over a decade yeah, yeah. i it was you know a lot of things happens as a coincidence i was in the mountain in austria and, and a nephew of mine asked me uh, the name of the flower and i knew only the most obvious and i felt bad i said i've been in, into the mountain all my life and I don't know the flower. So I bought a book with very, you know, bad photo and I couldn't figure it out. And I bought a box of watercolor just to force myself to observe the flower. And that was another one of those moments. Like the, I really had a, this feeling of the brush on the paper, I loved it. So, so at the beginning, I understood that I had a whole language to learn because I, I never draw or paint it ever, not even as a child. It's not something is in me. And it was like a discovery, a whole new alphabet. So it was really very, very interesting. So at the beginning I painted whatever. I was also busy. I had other activity as far as work. So, but I used every free moment. I set up a still life and, you know, and then when, uh, when I understood that it was, 
a lot more than I thought. That was not a hobby, that, that this activity was taking a lot of room in my life. I thought that I needed a subject matter and it was kind of natural to, to find a mountain that I love. Because one thing that I really want to say is that, see, I, I spend a lot of hours in my studio and painting. It is very important to have something that you have a true love and that can, because you need to be enamored of what you do. And that shows in the work, no matter what you paint. So I was lucky that, that I had such a love for something that I could, you know, transport in, in, in my painting. So sure, it, yeah. went, it went kind of natural. Yeah. Sure. And you mentioned, you know, moving to New York City, and I know you've been there for a while. Um, has painting these mountains, does that help you reconnect to uh, the, your homeland in northern Italy? You know what? When I go around New York, those are like my dolomites. I raise my eyes on those skyscrapers. I love that verticality. It's very much a similar thing. You know, mm -hmm. It's interesting the question you ask, and, and I thought about it because also, you know, the, the show, and I think it's a very interesting title and a very interesting uh, subject matter. I, I try to fight nostalgia because I think that it has a, a negative connotation. I think that, that one thing I have learned in my life is to live my present, to live in the present. When you're younger, the younger you are, and more you are never where you are, you always like to be someplace else or think of someplace where you are not physically or emotionally. And the older you get, um, and I love being older, the more you understand that, that, that you can live in a place. So when I realize that the mountain is part of me, I'll bring it with me. I need some time, I love to come to Italy and refresh that love because it really works, like it charges my battery because, because I mostly work, uh, when I'm in New York, I mostly work out of photographs. But I don't think I have that nostalgia because I belong there, you know? I bring it with me. Yeah, so really well said. Um... And so talking a little bit about how you make your paintings, you work exclusively in watercolor. How did you get started with that media? Well, you know, I started, I didn't choose it. I had no, no idea really, honestly. And I, I thought of watercolor, I don't even know why. Or better, it's not true, because I have always loved the watercolor as a media, but I, I didn't start thinking that I would have become a painter. I thought, started because of, I wanted to learn to use the flower. And it has a lot of advantages as far as, you know, doing work in outdoor because it's easy to transport, you stick it in your backpack, you don't need to wait it to dry. It is very, very portable. And it teaches you a lot because, because really for the quality of the media, because but anyway, before talking to the media, I, I want to talk about how I proceed. So I, let's say I take an, an image that I want to paint, which is a photograph. So first of all, I need to understand how that image translates in a pictorial alphabet. And what I mean is that the painting is composed by line, by color field, by by color temperature. It is composed by an alphabet that is a painterly alphabet. So, and, and I like to try to simplify, to, to give the viewer the less amount of messages possible, if being capable to portray what I like mm -hmm. to portray. Yeah. And then I usually start I really work out of repetition because I usually make a black and white sketch. Actually, earlier on, and I plan to go back to it, I take a piece of paper and I try to make 
only straight line or, or circle, or portion of a circle, so that I get the real, real structure. I saw a drawing of the guitar of Picasso at MoMA years ago, a fantastic show. And I look at his work, and at one point I saw that just the, the courage of only doing straight and angle and circle and really get to the core. That is a good uh, practice because sometime along the course of a painting, the painting brings you where he wants, not where you want. And to have something that remind you what you wanted out of that painting and what really make sense for you, it, it's really important. Then I do um, like a value study, either in charcoal or I do drawing. So to familiarize with the image. Mm -hmm. And then I do watercolor. I do a watercolor sketch, let's say oh, inches, 30 by 40 centimeter, about this big. I don't, you know, I know inches in the bigger size. <laughs> I don't know inches in the smaller size. So this is how mixed I am. When I do small, I think in centimeter. Then when I go large, I go yeah. to, by 22 by 30, I switch into inches. <laughs> Another format that I always work. And sometimes I understand that there are some parts or some passages that I am not clear about. So sometimes I do study or detail or I do revisit color. Because my goal is always to try to paint as large as possible. Because in watercolor is the challenge because it's very, very difficult. And also my subject matter works because the mountains are majestic by nature. And to really be able to do 40 by 60 is like, boom, it's in your face. You cannot ignore it. You feel like walking in it, you know, and, and climbing yeah. in it. So I do, I am working now on a mount called Cernio. And I think that today I was working on the ninth painting of the same, of the same image, you know? Yeah. And also mm -hmm. another thing is that I have kind of a double reading of the mountain because by climbing a mountain, you should, if you are a good, a good mountaineer, you should try to, to, climb through a logical route, which is what the mountain offer you, which could be a series of cracks or a ridge of a... And, and so I, when I look at an image, I not only look at something visually beautiful or painterly, but I also know that other aspect that also helps me to divide the image in big blocks and in a way simplify it. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I really proceed. Uh, and then when I feel comfortable, I go to, you know, 22 by 30, which is already in watercolor in okay format. And then if I'm, if I am completely in control, I go one step above, which is 29 and a half by 41, and then the 40 by 60. And when I say, if I am capable, the point is that in watercolor, the real trick is to be fresh. Mm -hmm. You know, it's nothing worse than a watercolor overworked. You look at the painting and you should have the feeling that it was easy, that it painted itself, that it was just loose and free. And so to do that in those surfaces is very, very difficult. So, yeah. Yeah, no, you're right about that. And that's one thing I really enjoy about your work is that you've got these massive, uh, uh, this massive scale, um, but you're using watercolor and watercolor is such a light and airy sort of uh, uh, feel to it. So that when you're portraying these mountains, there's already that, you know, small disconnect, you're able to portray, you know, this giant, you know, grand, you know, part of nature with watercolor, you think with the rocks and the crags, you know, maybe mountains should be done in this heavy impasto oil. Um, but no, I, I think you're, you really successfully capture these mountains with, with watercolor, which I think is, um, you know, very difficult. And it's one sort of thing that you mentioned in there that you, you leave certain things out of your paintings so that the viewers can come in and, and complete them. And, and that's another thing that I really like about your work is, is, so is it important for you to sort of hold back on some of your personal memories of these of these mountains so that other 
so that viewers may be able to uh, read, um, you know, and kind of put their own personal histories into the work? I think that there are, there are two questions in your question, and I'm going to give you two, two answers. <laughs> One question is more into the media of the painting. If you take an image and you try to put in a painting everything that the image gives you, it saturates you, it becomes, you know, o o o overdone and it, it is completely unpleasant. So sometimes um, you emphasize uh, certain passages, uh, you know, eliminating all the unimportant line and only using one that is the one that holds it on. So in a painterly way, I, I try not to feel everything and, and let the viewer complete the image. But, but so this is part of your question. On, on the other, I, I am very much against um, reading a painting as a metaphor and I think that we have uh, been taught to do that probably because most of the history of painting came from the commission from the church in the Western world, obviously. So when the artist was asked to uh, paint the virgin that ascend to the sky, you have a narrative there that, that you need to, you know, to just to please your commission, you need to, to tell that story. And, and so we are used to think about the painting in those terms. But we are after Jasper John's time when he painted an American flag that has no story to tell so that you focus on how you, you tell it. So I think that the, the, the media is, is the answer, not, the, not, not any other story, you know? And the other thing, it's important for me, I, I, I try to play with my viewer in terms on how I want the viewer to circulate in the painterly, painterly surface. But I don't want to instill emotion in the painter. That's not my job. That's it. What the viewer sees in my painting is it has nothing to do with me. I am obviously very happy if people see something or find something or respond to it. And this is the ultimate thing, but it's not up to me to suggest any of those, you know? Yeah. In fact, it's for me, you know, in, in Italy, when I exhibit here, people know those mountain and they are very um, pleased by the portraiture aspect. But when I show in America, people don't know it, you know, and I love that. So they look at my painting as such, not as for what they represent. Yeah, that's great. When I was doing research on your works, I would Google all of the mountains um, and see, you know, uh, that they're actually real ones. And, um, you know, it's, uh, you can easily see, you know, tell that, you know, Guzala is Guzala River. Um, so that was really great. But um, now I um, wanted to see if Katie could put up some images from the website, from uh, the images that we have uh, in the Displacements uh, exhibition. Um, and maybe if we can pick maybe that third, third one. Um, it's sort of a good, good one. It, uh -oh. And um, yeah, so if we take a look at this one here, um, I wanted to kind of talk about how and you mentioned this word just a few minutes ago, portraiture. Um, so a lot of times when I'm looking at your works and especially with those that don't have a, a foreground, uh, they really read as portraits of the mountains. Um, and there are even some of them where the sky is very ambiguous. It almost looks like um, it might be floating in space. If you scroll to the, the portrait one, uh, that's Tora Fanis. Um, it's kind of pinkish. But that's a, a really um, interesting one that sort of has a, um, uh, you know, a very ambiguous background. Um, do you, and these are certainly landscape works, but do you uh, ever, ever think of these as being portraits of the mountains themselves? I don't know if I am on it. I, am I okay? 
I don't see yeah. the homework, yes. Um, well, the first time that that I did that, I was uh, reading the letter uh, between Cezanne and his mom, and, um, and 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 he wrote to his mom, "I don't finish uh, my painting for the idiot." You know, so let's say it was like as to say, when I am finished, when I said what I needed to say, that's that's all I I do. I don't I don't you know finish it up. And I was in the middle of the painting and I said, yeah, this is the moment to stop here, you know, because, because that made exactly the crispness and the strength that I wanted out of that shape. And it was, it didn't need any other information. And sometimes, you know, I, I choose this and that's the beauty of being, um, of being the, an artist in, in painting instead of a photographer. A photographer, they have to deal with reality. Yeah, they can modify it in Photoshop, or they can change a little bit, but there is nothing else they can really do. And, but and on the opposite, I can decide to do anything I want with my image, you know? It's, it's like, a, I feel like a creator. Sometimes, you know, I, I, I paint and I said, okay, now here, I create a big shadow and put down the paint and it works, you know, or, you know, when I was working sometime in pastel, I made, okay, now I, I make a very good snowstorm and I, you know, it's funny and, and, yeah. and interesting. Yeah, it is. And maybe if you, if you can scroll to another one, Katie, particularly one that maybe has like a green uh, foreground in it. Noticed you've been doing, yeah, like this one, the marmalada. Um, this, uh, you've been putting a lot more of these green foregrounds in there. So now we sort of see the mountain from a distance. Is there any sort of reasoning in this, uh, you know, general trend in your work? I think that I had a, like a need of that, um, a desire of, of, of being less close. Maybe it was, maybe, maybe it was um, less insecurity and more feeling more comfortable and that became much worse after the quarantine because uh in italy i was we were locked for over two months that really we couldn't go any place and and i think i had such a desire of grass of green of open that i really i painted in those two months, the, the greenest green possible. I had really a desire of it. Uh, one thing I want to tell you about that I forgot that I think it's important when we were talking about the size and the, mm -hmm. and the watercolor, yeah. you know, to make myself a little bit in much worse shape, uh, to make it more difficult, I, I choose, uh, I try to mix only uh, um, color that granulate means that they maintain their own identity, which are the hardest to paint because they are like sandy, they don't go smooth. And those work in the greens so well. It is so different to see the painting in real life and to see the reproduction, even though I try to have good reproduction, but it still misses all the emotion on the surface. That yeah. Yeah, you are right about that. We have a museum, and that's why we have shows, right? When exactly, we don't, have, yeah. we don't have COVID. Yeah, exactly. Hopefully, we'll be seeing your works in person, you know, very soon. Um, and wanted to um, maybe uh, we have I have a couple of comparison slides um, that Kay, Kay can put up there, but I wanted to ask you because a lot of these mountains you paint, you know, many times, and so here's a, a good example, and this one kind of shows this you know, introduction of the, the foreground. Um, but you can also see you know, general differences um, in this, this mountain. Um, what, I guess maybe we can start at, how, do you typically paint mountains you know, many times? And what happens as you paint them over and over again? Do you learn anything new? Oh yes, it, it's, it is a whole learning process because the, the subject matter is, is the painting, is not the mountain. So I, 
And first of all, the mountains, especially the Dolomite, they change so much according to the hour, day, and the season. They have so many nuances to give you, to give an artist. I am very surprised that mountain has not been painted more than they have been because they're such a good subject matter. I really did study that pretty deeply and I also wrote an article recently on the history of the representation of the mountain, which I find very, very interesting. Anyway, yes, I go back and repaint and repaint the same subject. Now, in these two images that you have now on screen, when you see that, like that peak that is more uh, in the foreground on the snowy side is the same that is in the middle of the image in the background. Yeah. The other interesting thing is that, okay, so I use a photograph, but for example, in my photograph, the height of the two snowy mountain in the background, they were pretty much the same. Not that they are the same in real life, but the way the photograph, one is higher, but further away, one, I completely modified that and I, distorted it so that it could be made more interesting painterly and it created more of a sense of space. Obviously, you know, the further away something, the less you need to tell because, because the fuzzy, fuzziness create also a sense of space. This is something Leonardo da Vinci taught us <laughs> some time ago. Exactly. So yes, it is the same mountain. Now this on the right side, that green that is very velvety in real life, when you see the painting, I painted that during COVID. I really had a need of that. <laughs> yeah, um, absolutely. And so when you, how many times will you paint a painting? Will you paint them over and over like 10 or more times? Like, or will you paint a, a specific mountain? Okay, I have a mountain, it's called Mount Pelmo. A friend of mine says that I have Pelmitis because I have painted that mound so many times. And I always find, you know, because the thing is that my eye changes, my capability, what I see and what I can do out of an image, you know, it progresses. And so I go back and, and I repaint the image. It, it is, it, it, that, that's how I proceed. It, it is totally my way of working. But also in watercolor, when you really own the image, that you really know how it works in every part and every transition from one plane to another, how it works, you can be, you can paint with that sense of freshness, that, which is something I really aim to try to get in, in watercolor. Yeah, and it, you know, it really comes through, um, you know, having seen some of your works in person that that airy quality and Katie if you could go to the next slide um, these uh, another um, pair of works done a few years in between and the, the one from 2017 we were fortunate to have here in the Halsey and it is one of your big ones the 40 by 60 inches um, but you can see um, you've done it again recently um, in this one there's a less less of a, of, of a difference um, than we saw in the last pair of slides of the, the marmalada um, yeah. do you yeah, do you, when you kind of paint and repaint a specific mountain, are there times where you try to paint it the same or do you focus on uh, different uh, aspects of it? How does, um, how, how do you end up having, you know, a couple of works that, that end up kind of looking a little bit similar but are, are different when you examine all the details? You know, it, it's a little bit of a story behind it because I was here with COVID and um, somebody asked me if they wanted to buy the painting and I said, and I said, I'm sorry, but I have it in America because I'm always have this divided life. And then I looked at the image and I looked at it and I said to myself, I could do better. I could do better. So I repainted it. Now, unfortunately, the photograph don't give the right on how much better the painting on the right side is compared to the one on the left side. Uh, I think that the mountain has more uh, verticality. It's a one board I miss in English, but it goes, it has an energy that goes up. The one on the right side, the one on the, the, on the left, it's a little bit more 
you know, short and 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 un, and unelegant, you know. And also the color choices, the way I mix the color are different. And I also on the left, the one on the left side, I was in that phase of when I say enough, that's all I do. I don't I don't want to proceed, you know. On the one on the right side, three years later, I thought that I could finish the foreground more and let just the background be what it is. Mm -hmm. Now, it's another thing that I want to point out that I always find funny. The white of the snow and the white of the background is the same white because it's the color of the paper. And they read very different. The background look pinkish. And not only, what I find interesting is that not only your eye perceived it, but photograph does the same. Because also photograph or scanner uh, works by interval. And so also the photograph reads the background darker than the foreground. In this case, it works perfectly well because it makes the snow shine more. Because the snow, it's surrounded by darks. So that's why it looks, it looks wider. I think that the one on the right looks successful. And yeah. I, will, I think that it, it could be that in three year time, I look at it and I say, ah, I can do whatever, you know, make it and, and repaint it. I love to repaint things. Actually. Yeah, it's also, definitely. It's also a, we were talking about the meditative aspect to it, you know? Mm -hmm. It's not, it first of all, is not about very much a result. It's very much about the process, which is, which is interesting. And it is, it is putting you back in the relationship with a space, in the relationship with the mountain, in the relationship with, for example, the negative space, the negative space on the left is much less interesting than the one on the right. Because I think that the, left lower corner it's almost out but not out i mean the image is so much more dramatic because the line of the ridge on the left side on the painting on the right it's much more interesting yeah that's a good observation for sure and talking about this negative space i think we get back to this idea of you know mountains as a portrait i think what I love about this is that, you know, particularly in the, the 2017 one, is this negative space, you know, the, in the bottom right corner, it's, you know, the, the exact same color because it's the paper as the, the sky above it. And, you, you know, if you, you kind of make your eyes play tricks and sort of look at this where the mountain is just floating in space, you know, and then it becomes, you know, less of a, it's, the mountain is no longer part of a landscape. And this is more of a, a portrait you know, of a mountain. And so that's, um, you know, one thing I really, really liked about your work and how you kind of, you know, play with this idea of what a landscape is and what, you know, part of a landscape is and how do you take something and, you know, completely divorce it from its landscape or the, the context um, in which we find it. Um, so yeah, that's, um, you know, one thing I really like about, about, about uh, these works here. Um, did one, yeah. I, I want to say one uh, that I thought recently, landscape is by definition, how to say, it doesn't have feature, it doesn't have treats. The mountain is, and I really enjoy the word, uh, word that you use, divorce from the ground. It's absolutely perfect. You know, the mountain, the way I paint it, for me, they do have feature. I rec I, they have a shape that I recognize that I love that I know, and I also know all the climbing aspect to it. So layer of histories. There are certain places, for example, this Tour de Fanis, in that area, they, it was an amazing winter in, in uh, the First World War, where 100,000 mountain soldiers died in one winter. And people was exactly there. So I have so many layer to to look at these images that for me are important. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. That's a really, that's a really good, um, you know, thing to add. There are, you know, political histories, you know, that that are tied to these landscapes 
um, you know, they don't reveal themselves at, at first glimpse. Um, so yeah, and then one more thing I wanted to ask you about, each year you, um, you work with a writer to you know, write a story um, and then you publish books and we have, have them all here. Um, this is one of them. And then your works are featured alongside these stories. Fortunately, they're mainly in Italian. I believe there's one in English. Um, but how did this project get started and how do you see your work as functioning you know, with these texts? Well, uh, I have a true love for books. I always had, and I really, literature has been a big, big part of my, of my life. And in fact, all the people that wrote are all friends of mine. And you would think I run out of people. No, I have a list for years of people that, you know, that I know that, that would write. Uh, all the, all the short stories have a mountain as a theme, sometime more literal, sometime more in the background, but they all have that as a theme. And I love doing those projects. I, project. I do once a year and they kind of, uh, it's kind of give the rhythm of, of my work. And it is, I take a lot of care in doing it. I, I'm very fussy about the color and how they're printed and how they are, you know, tight. The funny thing is that my painting are reproduced very small and very often when people see my work, they're completely surprised because they're used to see those, they look like stamps, you know, very, very tiny. When they arrive and it's, you know, kind of completely different. Now it's important for me and, and I really, hope that I will be able to continue doing it. I'm already now working on the one. Usually I issue them around Christmas because mm -hmm. it's, it started as an idea with a friend writer to do, to do it as like a Christmas card. And then, you know, it became a project and it had its own life and I love doing yeah. that. Yeah, you know, I know you, you graciously send them to the Halsey every year so i always look out for that each uh, each holiday season so um they're they're beautiful but Thanks. yeah um well that's something i'm I'll, I'll jump back in here and so ricardo that's a nice thought brian reminded me you know perhaps we can look forward to a treat here at the end of 2020 an extraordinary year um having a new a new piece a new book from from you to look forward to maybe <laughs> that would be excellent actually really wonderful well thanks so much ricarda you know i i too am from the mountains i'm from the mountains of southwest virginia and now i'm here in charleston a very flat um, beautiful place with the beach but i appreciate your sentiment on kind of having a battery recharge and there is something something about the mountains that um if you're from them, if you love them, you know, is part of you. And I, I love that, seeing that expressed in, in your work and hearing you talk about it. But I'm curious, you know, and, and for our, our viewers, you've mentioned a couple times about having this divided life between New York and Italy. And you're in Italy now, and I know um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, you've had a, you've, you've alluded that you've had kind of an unexpectedly long stay in, in Italy during the pandemic away from your home in New York. So I was just, I was wondering, you know, have, has this unexpected stay in Italy brought with it any new thoughts on, um, on your two homes? I'm sorry, there's an <laughs> ambulance going by right now. Um, but I'm wondering if this unexpected stay has brought any new thoughts about your two homes, the U.S. and Italy, now being in, in Italy perhaps longer than you had thought you would be? Well, you know, for me, that is an ongoing thought because, because for some destiny, this has been my life, you know, and I made kind of peace with it. Usually I have a different rhythm and we, my husband and I came here mid-February for staying a short time. I was supposed to have a show here and a wedding to go to and obviously nothing happened and then it was COVID. But last year um, at the end of the summer a friend of mine who is an architect had a space very very close to our apartment with a fantastic light and um, 
and it was out for rent because she dropped it. And I decided to rent it. I felt kind of guilty. I felt spoiled that I needed a, a show in a, a place to work in Italy, a studio. It was such a blessing because also in the deepest quarantine, we sneak out and I went to the studio and worked and it was so peaceful. Nobody around, nobody in the street. And I concentrate and I got a lot of work done and I got very spoiled by being here. And if I, you know, the, the division really is that I have two children. One lives in LA and one lives in Austin, Texas, and they are a big attraction. But also the New York cultural life is a big attraction for me because I have learned a lot by visiting museums and by seeing amazing art because New York is the center of the world on that aspect. Also, sometime also even technical question, I went to the Metropolitan Museum to see how major artists from the past solve certain things. So it's a great opportunity. I guess I could not live in America all the time, but I couldn't live in Italy all the time. I really belong to both, you know, and I hope to be able to, and also sometimes it's, it's great to, when you have the chance to go and live someplace else, you see your life from outside and you become more critical and you have more chances to see other things. I think I'm very lucky and, and this is very enriching. Is that an English word? I, I yeah. spoke much Italian lately. <laughs> My English is a little rusty. But... No, it's great. Yeah, I... oh, sorry, Brian. Yeah, I... I was just gonna say, oh. Go ahead, Katie. I'm sorry. No, you, you go. You go. Well, I was going to say, yeah, this, this split, um, you talk about sort of being belonging to both places. And I'm just kind of thinking in my mind, you um, you typically draw, you know, these mountains from Italy. Is there, have you ever considered, you know, uh, drawing anything from America? Or is it, is, is your familiarity with these mountains, is that what um, keeps you just drawing those? You know, all the mountains are beautiful. I don't want to say that these are beautiful and the other one are not. And, and one thing that the United States offer is the most amazing nature. I mean, undoubtedly it's a fantastic country from that point of view. But see, this mountain for me have, have a face, you know, they have a face that I have feeling, I have personal history on it and it is only one mount that I would be curious on painting. It's called the Mount of the Cross, like Thomas Moran painted, painted it, and other other American painted, painted it, and that is something that really attracts me. So I might I might sooner or later go there, but honestly, mountain wise, my heart is here. Yeah, in it. absolutely. <laughs> I loved your comment that um, the the skyscrapers of Manhattan are your 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 American Dolomites. Oh, um, absolutely! That's that was a beautiful sentiment. And I go around looking up, and people say, "What are you looking?" I said, "I know what I'm looking." <laughs> looking about my Dolomites here, and sometimes even you know, at certain time of day, for example, if you are you know like uptown and on a sunset time that it reflects, it really, they change color, you know, because of the light, it's beautiful. Absolutely, I, I agree. It's a reminder to all of us to take in our, our surroundings in a different way and see the face of, of our own landscapes here in our homes. Absolutely. I, I love that sentiment. Well, um, I, I actually was wondering about Brian too. Brian, you, this is the second time I mentioned that you've, you've written about Ricarda's work and uh, so you too are now becoming familiar with uh, Ricardo's mountains and I wondered you know I gave you a very short um, word count to work with uh, for this, this this project but I was wondering if there was anything that you wished that you had room to cover um, that you wanted to be able to explore more in your essay that you didn't have the room to. Yeah sure I mean there's there's so much to talk about I think <clears throat> one thing I didn't talk about enough was the use of watercolor. And I think, um, I think, uh, you know, 
it's it's a very difficult medium to work with and i know ricardo says that but i think it's it's you know especially doing it at 40 by 60 inches it's you know a very tough thing to do and but the way that it is effective in sort of presenting these mountains as these big you know grand um, elements of nature um you know despite all of the sort of inherent qualities and, and and the reputation of watercolor um which i think is really fascinating um so yeah i i would i would love to sort of study the medium you know a little bit more and and again i think i focused mainly on the sort of uh progression of kind of the uh you know your earlier works being more distant more um you know the, the mountains being more divorced from their landscape and slowly the foreground starts starts appearing more and more um but yeah and then also just see the comparisons between uh different mountains as well uh you know uh, kind of seeing how they they shift over time would have been um you know i think there's there's a ton that that one could write about and and see in your work as well so yeah, definitely a lot that I would have loved to uh, cover, um, you know, in this in this small essay that we had. Well, maybe we'll have. I hope we don't have an uh, uh, an occasion like another pandemic to provoke a displacement 2.0. But I always enjoy, um, you know, I've, I've enjoyed reading your point of view on Ricardo's work two times now, and I can attest, you know, that. Rick viewing Ricardo's work in person, you know, Ricardo, it is, it is so different. And this is, this is the downfall of a virtual format because when we had your exhibition here in 2017, I loved walking into that room, that gallery and um, being in front of the work, those, especially those massive 40 by 60s. And it is a different experience and you do kind of transport your viewers to, um, to a kind of a peaceful or a different, um, a special place with those mountains. So thank you for sharing new work with us for Displacements was, was so exciting to see alongside some familiar pieces we recognize from the show and other works as well. So um, that was a great experience for us. And thank you so much, Ricarda and Brian for talking with us today across space and time. Uh, thanks to the magic of, of the internet and Zoom. Um, and thanks to all of you for watching here on Facebook Live. And um, this morning's talk between Ricardo de Ecker and Brian Granger is only one in a series of many conversations that will take place over the remainder of 2020. So I invite you to mark it on your calendar, tune in in two weeks time for a conversation between Dr. Fahamu Peku and Ruth Rambo on Thursday, October 8th at 7 p.m here again on Facebook Live. And in the meantime, visit displacements.org to experience the exhibition and put the upcoming events on your calendar and to further explore the amazing work of Ricardo de Ecker. So thank you so much for joining us, everybody, and be safe and well, and we'll see you in two weeks. Awesome, thanks so much, Ricardo. It was great to chat with you. Thank you very much. I love the Halsey. I really love it. I always have such a good experience to just work with you guys. And thank you very much to both of you and, and, and to give me the chance of exhibiting my work in such a, such a, you know, private time where artists are, you know, it's such a lonely job and to be able to share it even in the pandemic has been really great. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, ciao. Ciao. Ciao.